or resembles theirs. That's my people. Listen, I'm not anybody's people except the people of God. And if you think I'm going to join the bandwagon of thinking that just because you share my skin tone that I'm your people, you are sorely mistaken and sorely antichrist. Now these things are not mutually exclusive. But that's what's wrong. That's why our churches are segregated. I've got to worship with my people. Three Saturdays ago we had a unity service with different skin tones. It's not even a race. You know we're one race, right? The human race. Any third grader knows that. But we forget it by the time we get older. No one race. Nationalities, different. One race, the human race. There's no different, there's no subset of genus in the human biology that I believe in. Darwin would say otherwise. color, creed, religion, purpose. What really matters in our lives? Why do we describe or align with such things? When we ought to align under the banner of Christ, the two families, ultimately, as I said, the natural man, the new man, the darkness, the light, wickedness, righteousness. You know what it ultimately boils down to? Those who are dead and those who are alive. And there are many whose bodies have died, but they're more living than most people who breathe air. Those who are dead are not those who have passed on from this life, but those who are still in their sin, not believing on Jesus Christ. And those who are alive are those whom God has called His children through Christ the Lord and the Savior. Grace to you, verse 2 and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We spent 73 minutes on this last week. I will do my best to try to cut it in half for the remainder of our time. No. What's the point? It's fresh enough on our minds I don't have to revisit last week. You know what this is. You know what's happened. What is the grace of God in relationship to the intimacy of Him being our Father? The grace of God means that God adopted us. He brought us into something that we could not come into on our own. Nowhere in the history of the world that I know about, so I just want to keep the fallacy off the table, that I know about, that's a fallacy in itself, but have I ever heard of babies ringing doorbells for adoption? Never heard of it. Have you? You ever seen toddlers walking down the streets? Knocking on doors saying, hey, I'm your new baby. Are there really storks shoving babies down chimneys? Not, not happening. And every child that's ever been born into this world has been born into the family in which they've been born without any discussion, desire, collaboration, conference or consideration. You don't pick to be adopted. You don't pick to be born. You don't pick my family, that family, that family. What's the better family? God picks. And that's a terrible word. God adopts us. And that is a gracious gift. How? By grace, through faith. Grace is the gift. Grace is the unmerited gift. Faith is the product of that grace. Faith is part of the grace. By grace you have been adopted, beloved. God is your Father. The song that we've sung a lot, we haven't sung it in a while, Abba Father. When we first started singing that, several of you... I don't know if I like that song. It seems too personal. This is Abba Father, Daddy. We like the word Abba because it's not in our language, so it seems formal. But it means Daddy. 
The translation of Abba in English is Daddy. Now friends, I don't know about y'all, but I don't go up to any man in the street and say, Hey, Dad. I don't know about you, but I don't go up to just anybody else's dad and, and, and say, Dad, can I talk to you? I go to my dad. That's the kind of intimacy that God has afforded us through Jesus Christ the Son. He's brought us into His being, into His presence, into His righteousness through Jesus. And we were not worthy to step into His presence. But He's bought us. He's cleansed us. The grace of God, the Father, has adopted us. He's made us one in Christ Jesus. And that's how we can see this word that we are one, we have grace, here we go, right here, in God, the church, in God our Father. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, through and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we are intimately bound with God. Now this is the, this is the cause of what then Paul preaches. This is the actual power behind the suggestions and the commands and the decrees that we see. Because God is our intimate Father, because we are adopted by God's grace in Christ Jesus, therefore the product of being a child, we will resemble our DNA. Let's use that. Not literally. But our DNA will echo that of our parent. So that when we once were dead, living in sin, being, living in debauchery, living in drunkenness, living in lies, living in selfishness, because now we are no longer bound to our earthly father, Adam, in sin and wickedness, God's Spirit works in us and brings us into a place where we begin to resemble His righteousness. And this... Grace and this peace is given to us by our Father because of His great love with which He loved us in Christ. We have peace. In Christ, we have grace. In Christ, we have a Father who is God. And look what happens. Because these things are true, verse 3, what does it say? We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of everyone for one another is increasing. Look at that. Because God is our Father, because He has effectually saved us, adopted us, brought us into His presence through Jesus Christ, therefore we ought to give thanks. As grace extends to more and more and more. What does Paul say? Increasing thanksgiving to God. Why are you saved? Because of the great love of God. That's right. Because God loves you. Because Christ died. That's right. I'm not talking about why. To what end? To what end? Well, let me put it this way. To the end that our joy is everlasting, pure, that our happiness is unwavering. It's going to confuse you in the next verse, isn't it? We are saved to the end that our joy is complete, that there is nothing in this world ever, all eternally, that would ever damage our joy. And how does that happen? That's not even the end, is it? That's just another process along the way. The end of it is that our joy is complete in the praising of God and thanking Him for His love for us. Thanking Him for His grace. Praising Him forever. That's why you were saved, beloved. Do you know what heaven is like? Heaven ain't going to have your style of music. Heaven's not going to have your style of clothes. Heaven's not going to have your kind of people. Heaven is going to be the fullest of everything we've ever imagined because nothing will stand in the way of us worshiping Christ. Every moment of eternity. 
You know what eternity is? No time at all. There's no, no, it's not no time. It's, it's longer than that. There is no time at all. There's no clock. There's no sunset. There's no measurability of any span. It's as if we're stuck in one minute forever and it never stops. And that one minute is the most glorious, most joyful, most satisfying moment that ever existed in the cosmos. And all we're going to do forever and ever and ever and ever is be satisfied in the worship of our Savior. Does that scare you? It better not. Because heaven's not going to be anything else. Well, what about those mansions? You keep working for one. You won't get it. You want to know what that means? Come Tuesday. We ought to always give thanks to God. God is our Father. And the Scripture teaches that all good things come from above. All good things come from the hand of our Father. Our Father loves us. He gives us everything we need. The response to all that God does in any form is always thanksgiving. Is it not? Another way of saying thanksgiving is praise. We worship Him. We're thankful for Him. We're thankful for what He's doing in our lives. So we ought to always... That's the difference in the first part of 1 Thessalonians and the first part of 2 Thessalonians. He gives that ought. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, we give thanks to God always, constantly remembering you in our prayers. We thank God always. Here, he says, we ought to always give God thanks. He puts a compulsion there, an obligation to the church, to the, to the apostles. This is what we must do. We have no other thing to do. We have no other place to go. We have no other answer to the work of God except that we ought to praise Him and thank Him for His work. Hallelujah! Praise you, Lord, that you're doing the work in these people. How often does that ring from our own lips? In two decades of ministry... I can honestly tell you that if I were to catalog it, I'd probably have a volume or seven of complaints and a little steno pad of praises. Because it's so easy. It's so easy to complain. And there's every opportunity. You watch and you see and you complain. You consider, you assume, you complain. You look in the mirror of your soul and you complain. You complain that sister so-and-so is not as righteous as me. So-and-so is a little immature than me. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too long, it's too tiring. And so on and so on. I saw the uh, TV yesterday when we were at a baby shower. And I saw the Georgia-Tennessee game. This is the first mention of sports I've ever done in a sermon. But I saw it. And I have not been to UGA in probably... I was probably 17 last time I went. Maybe 20. So over 20 years. Man, that place has gotten big. That stadium's a lot bigger than I remember it. I mean, I remember the last time I was there and there were people out there weed-eating the field. Mm. And with a blower blowing off the concrete bleachers. And I saw that thing and I thought, my goodness, look at the people. Look at the people. And they sat there all day. And they looked at that game. And when they got done, they called, I've been there for nine hours. Wow, does the time fly. And so many professing Christians want a five-minute devotion. They want a prayer around the meal. 
Thank you for this day. Thank you for this food. Nourish from our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, I mean, I've had fortune cookies more thorough. Are we really praying to anybody or are we just saying something? We ought to always give thanks. The work of God is that we praise Him for it. Praise is thankfulness. Consider our lives. Are we growing? Why was Paul thankful? Because of the growth of their faith. Are we growing? Are you growing? Because if you're not growing, we can't grow. If my left leg stopped growing when I was nine, I'd be a funny looking fella. Funnier looking. I mean, they'd probably call me Tilt or something. I don't know what they'd call me. I can imagine what school would have been like. I can imagine the things I would have created to cover it up. And the woodworking that I would have desired to whittle me a fake leg or something. But see, I can't. If I'm supposed to run a race and my left leg says, I'm done. I can't run. If one of you decide, I'm done, I'm not going to grow anymore, I'm not going to live for Christ, I'm just going to sit and stagnate until Jesus takes me home, hallelujah, then the whole body sits. Sit. God is praised by Paul because the body, the church, well, I just don't think I can mature like that. It doesn't matter where you are in your maturity. Paul didn't say, we're thankful that they're Grown up and fully done. Paul says, I'm thankful to God that they're growing. They're not staying. They're not stagnant. They're not moving back. They're not putting their hand. They did not put their hand to the plow and look back. Jesus says, if you do that, you're not worthy of Him. He despises you. Jesus despises me? Yes. Let the dead bury the dead, Jesus told the man who said, I want to follow you, but I need to go bury my father that I loved and he died. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. We don't have time, friends, to placate to worldly idolists. We don't have time to, to, to sit down and, 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 and just let the world go by and one day we'll start getting spiritual. Are we growing? Are you growing? Are you learning to love more and more? See? It's something to be taught it. Thank God for our love. Thank God for our growth. But then when the question's asked, are you loving? Are you growing? Then where is the thanksgiving? You know, if we're not growing in our faith together as a people, if we're not loving each other, through the power of God, then there is nothing to thank God for. So we can't see what Paul says. We ought to thank God. We ought always to give thanks for God for you, brothers, as is right. Do we thank God? No, you know what we do? I am so proud of you. That's what we say. I am so proud that you're growing in love. Really? Why are you proud of me? What have I done? See, that's the response that a Christian gives. It's not me. Don't, don't people say that? I'm so proud you're in church. I mean, and I'm not making fun of that. But I'm saying that's the mindset we have. I'm so proud that, that you're in church. I'm so proud that you're following Christ. I'm so proud that you're so loving. I'm so proud of who you've become. How about I'm so thankful? It's a completely different mindset. I'm so thankful. We give thanks to God, not to man. I am so glad that Pastor Tippins preached yesterday and saved my child. You ever heard that? Oh, yeah. I had somebody tell me, that Billy Graham saved them from hell. To which I said, I don't believe in Billy Graham. Three years ago, that followed me here to Georgia. Because that guy couldn't get over the fact I didn't believe in Billy Graham. I don't believe in Charles Spurgeon either. I don't put my faith in James Tippins. I don't put my faith in you. I don't put my faith in Paul. 
Paul, who is that? Nothing. A nobody that God used to bring to nothing the things that are. Put my faith in Jesus Christ and I praise God for what He's done. And I'm thankful that the Lord is working in me. And I'm praying and thankful that the Lord is working in you. Thanksgiving to God who wills and works for His good pleasure all that is good. Paul says, as is right. I want you to understand what this is really saying here. As is righteous. When you say something is right, you are saying it is righteous. When you say something is righteous, you are saying that it's just. When you say something is just, you are saying that it's holy. Listen to that, church. Right, righteous, just, holy. So what we call right, which is not holy, is wicked. Jesus even says that when the Pharisees saw the power of God, they ascribed it unto Beelzebub, a demon, the devil. And Jesus says that that's the blasphemy of, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is an unpardonable sin. You know why? Because you can't see clearly that which is God's work and then give someone else the credit. It's unbelief. It's blasphemous. That's why we need to really reflect on who we are and how we got there and what we're supposed to be and know that only God in His grace and power will do it. And that we thank Him because that's what is holy. Holy thanksgiving is the opposite of complaining. It's the opposite of fussing. It's the opposite of bitterness. It's the opposite of frustration. It's the opposite of doubt. It's the opposite of fear. It's the opposite of pity. It's the opposite of depression. It's the opposite of escapism. It's the opposite. Thanksgiving. My life is going down the toilet. Thank you, God. My body is dying. Praise you, Jesus. For what? Heck, if I die, I get to see Him. I'm worried about my family if I were to die. How supremely arrogant is that? I'm worried about my family if I die what they will feel or experience or suffer. That's like saying, God, I know you're sovereign and I know you're supreme and I know you're omnipotent and all these things, but you need me here. No, he doesn't. Just like he didn't need John the Baptist. Just like he didn't need Paul. Just like he didn't need John, the Apostle John. He uses us graciously and loves us intimately. But in no way does God need us. God could, if He so desired, have a pine tree bust in here and preach the gospel. But He has not decreed that. So it will not take place. What God has decreed is that we, with our natural minds and our natural mouths, speak natural language to our natural ears, and in doing so, He will supernaturally open them. Thanksgiving is fitting, not just because God is God, but because God is doing godly things. Because your faith is growing abundantly in the love of every one of you, Every one of you for one another is increasing in trials and in suffering. Let's put this to bed. In trials, your faith grows by the Lord's work. In suffering, your love is increasing. See what God does there? You know, for a second Peter, it says that he who suffers in the flesh is free from sin. You know what that means? You ever thought about it? When are we most likely to be self-sufficient? When everything that our little minds and bodies could desire is right in front of us. We can thank God for the gourmet. We can thank God for the, 
for the wardrobe. We can thank God for the income. We can thank God for the mansion. We can thank God for all of it. And we can feel justified in thinking, wow, this is great. God is good. But when it all takes away, can we say, blessed be the name of the Lord? We say those words, but yet the very place where they're pinned is the discourse with God and Job. Who when Job got the news that God, the author of his suffering, sent the devil, the agent of God's will, to destroy his home and crush his children and killed them. And Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because the natural mind and the argument of fallacious logic says that when all things are good, people praise God. But if all things turn bad, He will get no praise. God does that type of righteous worship in the hearts of His people. Because we do not love the world anymore. It is nothing but a tool for us to give Him glory. And when it comes, it comes. When it goes, it goes. Glory. And when we're suffering, we don't have time for selfishness. We don't have time for materialism. We don't have time to sit around and, and act like we're righteous. God works it in His people through suffering that we might identify with Christ in suffering. And then not only do we do that, but He gets praise in the midst of it. We grow in our faith in the midst of it. We learn to love people in the midst of it. For the Christian that's born of Christ, it is not suffering that keeps us together from being together. It is worldliness that keeps us from being together. Oh, I'm hurting. I'm suffering. Everything's a mess. I need to get my life together. That's worldliness. That's self-sufficiency. For those who are born of God, when the suffering comes, the Spirit of God prays for us and drives us to the center of Christness, Christ likeness and to the center of Christ's people. That's what He does. In trials, our faith grows. In suffering, our love increases to the praise of His glorious grace. Thank you, Father. Now I'm going to ask a couple of questions before I get to verse 4. How do we look, church? How do we look? Are we growing in suffering or are we consumed with our own problems? Are we loving each other in our trials? Are we enduring... As Paul would just say in, chapter, in verse 4. Think about the people in this room. Are these people on your hearts daily? Are these people on your mind? Are these people in your prayers? Or do you spend most of your time focused on you or some ambiguous lot of somebody who's not in your life? What's that supposed to mean? Like a show or a famous person who doesn't know anybody from Adam? Are we growing intimate? Do we pray for each other? Do we encourage each other? Do we rebuke each other? Do we train each other in righteousness? Are we investing in each other's lives? Are we coming together as often as we can, as the Lord commands? I want you to hear this, church. The old adage, the old cliche, preaching to the choir usually fits. But friends, if we're growing in love and affection for one another, if we're growing in faith, then our affection for our brothers and sisters who forsake the assembly should be on the top of our minds. Is the Lord truly God? Is God really God? If He is, He will produce a coming together desire, a fellowship desire in our hearts. If it's not there, then what? God commands us in His Word to be part of the local assembly. We must be members of a local church. Beloved, while I don't see church membership in you, just read all the letters and ask yourself how you are to obey 
submit, grow, give, invest, if not part of a body. It cannot be done. Not being in fellowship with a body who knows you, or worse, not desiring to be in fellowship is a direct defiance of the work of God in redemption. It's not a, it's not a choice we make to do churchy things. It's a drive by the Holy Spirit. Not being in fellowship precludes all other act of obedience. What? I'm going to obey God over here and here and here. You can't obey the New Testament at all if you're not in fellowship. Every command that we've learned in 1 Thessalonians cannot be obeyed if you're not with the body. It cannot, you can't obey God by yourself. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Well, that's a tall order. I can love, you can't love someone you're not with. It's a lack of understanding of what love is. God loves us, therefore He draws us to Himself through the sacrifice of Jesus the Son. So in the same way we love each other, we're drawn to each other through the sacrifice of our lives for one another. It's beyond ridiculous. It's absurd to think anything else about the assembly of the local church. We are not Romanists. We are not a cult. We are not Catholic. We don't believe that in processes of joining an institution that we get right with God through the sacraments. We believe that God has saved us through Jesus Christ as a gift of grace and that part of the power of God's grace is that He gives us ears to hear the words of Christ and in doing so, births us anew. Responding then in saving faith, we then are made like Christ more and more every day as a body and individually as unto the church. Assembling together, loving one, one, one another, fellowship together. I said this act of obedience precludes all other acts of obedience. And I believe that if we do not obey in these simple things, that it affords our prayers not answered, our lives not fulfilled, our minds are given over to fear and not transformation. Arrogance and self-reliance and superiority start to rise up and a picture of one's affections are skewed to their liking. Not being with the local church eliminates God-breathed accountability. It removes the ability to, de to obey New Testament teaching. <coughs> because the New Testament was lit written to the local assembly, not the individual Christian. Do you hear that, church? To the local assembly. If our love is increasing, beloved, we will see it and we will praise God for it. If our love is not increasing, it is either because of disobedience to God our Father or unbelief and we are not in Christ. But this church here, God was praised Brothers and sisters, my prayer is that we be a church that would give thanksgiving to God because of our growth, because of our love. Listen. We thank God for a lot of things. We thank God for healing. We should. We thank God for provision. Perfect. We thank God for restoration of marriage. We thank God for... We should. But as a church, the utmost of our gratitude should be for our intimacy and our maturity. Because we can thank God right now that the sun is up. 
And we can thank God right now that each of our bodies have blood flowing through them and that our lungs work. We can thank God this very moment that our minds can comprehend the English language and process these premises that we might understand them. We can thank God for the shoes that we have and the earrings that we have and the cars that we drove. We can thank God that we're not dying this very moment and we're not being perfect. We can thank God for a lot of things, but God is most glorified in praise when His people are living out His power. And in verse 4, Therefore, because you are living out in the power of God in love and in maturity, listen, we ourselves, the apostles ourselves, boast about you in the churches for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Who is this boast? The church. The church is the boast. Look how do they do it. Not look what those people are doing down there in Thessalonica. Look what our Father has done in those people down in Thessalonica. Wow! This is who you ought to be, Macedonia. This is what you are in Christ, Achaia. This is what you are. This is who God has made you to be. Grace, truth, would Paul, had he and Barnabas or Timothy or some of these men planted us, would they boast of us to the churches of Statesboro? Would they boast of us to Jacksonville? Would they boast of us to Atlanta? Would they boast of us to the East Bay of California? Would they boast of us? If not, we need to be a church worthy of boast. Boast to the praise and thanksgiving of God, not to the world. Let us be such a people in steadfastness and faith in persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. See this, there is never one person singled out persevering in their faith. This just hit me this morning. This hit me this morning. Nowhere, nowhere, even Paul did not singly, singularly persevere in his faith. Did he? Pray for us, brothers. Remember that? Pray for me that I would speak boldness. Pray for the Word of God that is not bound. Pray for us. So even the local church was the driving intimacy behind Paul's perseverance through the grace of God and His power. And that's powerful. We get to thinking so selfishly and so singularly and we forget that making it through some suffering alone is not glorious at all. Why not? I suppose, now keep in mind, this hit me this morning. I suppose that it's selfish. Working out and enduring, persevering alone is not glorious but selfish. Why? Because God has saved His people and He's glorified in their redemption which includes their unity, their intimacy, their enduring, their perseverance and doing so together. If I stand before you this day and said, I have endured much trial by myself, God is not glorified in it, and you have not been given opportunity to obey the commands in the New Testament in walking through it with me. Listen. And it's very hard to see. Because our culture and everything about it, at least in the last hundred years, is self-centered. Self-centered. We suffer well when we suffer together. Nobody will ever succeed in enduring in the faith by themselves. It's never happened. It's not going to happen. Now, if you are by yourself, if you are alone, if there is nobody, if there is no church, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and nothing but cannibals to eat you, 
then God is with you. But friends, we live that way by choice. We live that way by superior mindset that we can deal with it. So what do, we mean, what do we need to do? Just stand up here every Sunday and have a confession time? No, but there's got to be somebody in this local body who can pray for you explicitly. Not everybody. Not everything needs to be so public. But somebody, somebody can be there for you. Just like you can be there for somebody, but not everybody, can you? Can you serve everybody in this room? No. But we can serve each other through prayer. We can serve each other when we suffer through prayer. While we are not necessarily directly suffering for our faith at all times, our faith causes some present suffering to deepen. Now this is it. And I'm done. What's that mean? In other words, if, if there's problems in my life or suffering in my body, it's not necessarily directly related to my faith in Jesus Christ. Because my neighbor who hates him could suffer in the same way. But because I believe in Christ, my worldview is different. Because I'm a new creation in the Lord, I see things differently. And I'm going to approach them differently. And because of that, the wisdom of this world stands in opposition to that which I know will work. So that when the world comes along and says, just do this, just do that, think of yourself, be strong, don't worry about other people. And the Scriptures teach me otherwise. Now I'm persecuted for my faith in the midst of my suffering. Our faith causes our suffering to deepen. Why? How does that look? Because we rejoice when we're in the midst of pain. And that's odd to the world. That's odd to some people who actually are part of our churches. We hope when there should be no reason for hope. We're thankful to God for His work when it looks as though God has abandoned us by the world. It causes people to think we're crazy. One of the worst things to be called is dumb. I think second only to ugly. Somebody calls you ugly, that hurts your feelings. Somebody calls you dumb, it makes you mad. Because nobody wants to be ugly. Nobody wants to be dumb. But according to the Scriptures, we who believe in Christ are more than dumb. We're fools. And because of that, we suffer when we try to live out our faith. When we don't go railing over there and beating our neighbor up because he... Let his dog do business on our yard. When we don't curse out our family members because they did something to hurt us. When we don't go sue somebody because they dared cost us money. When we don't tell somebody the truth or to put it where the sun don't shine when they hurt our feelings or act ill toward us. We have hope when there's darkness all around. We're thankful for the work of God. We keep our joy in Christ Jesus while the world sits in fear. This political landscape right now is a good example of that. Fear, 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 fear. What's going to happen? Exactly what God decreed before the world began is going to happen. Nothing's going to happen outside of His decree. Everything that happens this day is in the decrees of God. Well, that's a hyper-sovereignty. There's no such thing. <laughs> he's either sovereign or He's worthless. And if God be God that needs to work on the whims and the worries of what man might do in this world, He's no better than the Zeus of Greece. We suffer in our suffering because of our faith, because we do all this together sharpening each other, rejoicing together. And we're not just the fool on the corner, we're the bunch of fools on the block. And the world looks and laughs. The world looked and laughed at Paul. As his head was taken from his body, they laughed and rejoiced and thought, we showed that fool. And he received the crown of righteousness. 
Jesus was mocked and laughed at as He walked the streets to the, to the cross. They mocked Him so badly they put a sign over His head, the King of the Jews. They put a crown of thorns on His head and hammered them into His skull. He was laughed at. He was laughed at. He was spat upon. He was ridiculed. Do you think we're going to live any differently? No, we're not. And friends, the power of God's grace is sufficient. And He works in our lives collectively that we might be there for one another during these seasons. Even if we all go to the fire, together we go. How do you think they kept finding Christians in the first century? Because they kept meeting together every day. How do you think they find underground churches in communist China and underground churches in this place and that place? Because they get to see where people are gathering. They go, something's amiss here. There's a mass assembling. There's a reason for our pain, beloved. So that we thank God for His grace and for His people. Loving each other is a requirement that is fulfilled in the power of Christ who saves us into a relationship with God the Father. As John would say in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and so we are. God calls us children because He suffered the Son unto judgment that we deserved so that we could be His righteousness. That's the kind of love the, the God the Father has for us, that He would sacrifice His one and only Son, begotten, that we might live. So that He would be the just and the justifier of all who have faith in Jesus Christ. So then, God loves us in a way that only He could love. For the reason that we could then love Him and then also prove our love for Him as we love each other. Jesus says, if you love Me, you will obey My commands. Jesus commands us to love one another. When we see in the Scripture, I have a new commandment. But it's not a new commandment, it's an old commandment that was with you, with you from the beginning. But it is this, that you love one another. John would say in his first epistle that if we say we walk in light, righteousness, holiness, Christ, but yet we do not love our brothers, we lie and the love of God is not in us. You know what that means? We need to understand what loving each other looks like. We saw that in this last letter. An interest, an investment, an intimacy. Those just come too easy. I'm sorry. We must love each other, not love ourselves. We must love and be invested in the lives of each other, not our own lives. If you love one another, you will pay attention then also to your life. How do we live? Oh, it's just my little secret sin. It's not your secret sin. When we live in secret sin, we actually deprive one another of our investment. We deprive one another of our prayers. We deprive one another of God's empowerment in our lives when one day we may speak the truth to them by the Spirit. We deprive one another. We'll pay attention to our lives for the sake of our witness as a people. One of us gets called in sin. All of us are brought under reproach. Christ is brought under reproach. It's not James that did that, it's those people at Grace Truth. If we love one another, we'll pay attention to our lives for the sake of unity. There's no greater disconnect amongst the people of God than when some of us are living in selfishness and sin and we don't want to see each other, do we? I don't want to go to church. I've been out for three weeks. I show up now. People are going to say, where have you been? What's been going on? And I don't really want to answer that truthfully, so I don't want to lie, so I'm not going to come. 
You don't answer texts, you don't answer calls, you don't answer emails. You hide. Your cars are in the driveway, y'all. Lights go out. Maybe you've got a clapper. Maybe it just, I mean, hide. We hide. Our intimacy is affected. We need to pay attention to our lives for the sake of harming one another. Friends, we harm each other when we sin. We harm each other when we're not loving toward each other. And all that while good, the most important reason we need to pay close attention to our lives and to our love is for the sake of the name of the Lord. This is where I started the whole thing. We look after the interests of others and not of our own. Does that sound familiar? Seek not after your own interests, but the interests of others. Because if you're seeking after my interests, and I'm seeking after their interests, and they're seeking after your interests, all of our interests are being sought after. But the problem is we believe the lie of the enemy and the lie of the world that if we don't take care of ourselves, no one will. Brothers, this is part of the manifold wisdom of God through the local church, is that we are doing the work of God and we can't explain how. It just happens. So our likes, our styles, our desires, our plans, our pains ought to be put aside for the sake of the, of the body because we love one another just as Christ has loved us. Is that true in your heart this day? Do you see the love of Christ do you know the love of God in Christ Jesus? Are you trusting fully in the good news of Jesus, on Jesus, in Jesus, because of Christ? What Christ has done for you has got to be your only hope. And it doesn't end at redemption. Redemption continues in this life and continues forever and culminates in glorification. Friends, are we preparing for glory? As a people? Or are we sitting in the corner waiting for our own slice so we can eat it by ourselves? I pray that the Word of God would bring us to an understanding and to a power that we might live as a people for the sake of His name. Let's pray. Lord, it never fails. Every time I consider... Being short, I continue to talk. Lord, so I pray that in all this verboseness, Lord, that You would take that which is necessary and You would slice it lean for our souls. That Your Word, first and foremost, would do the work and prepare us. Father, that those who may come this day and see that their need for Jesus as a Savior is paramount. Lord, that they would expressly see and believe on Jesus Christ explicitly, only, eternally. Lord, that our belief as Your children would hold us together, would give us our namesake would give us an intimacy that the world would look at and mock. Father, keep us from idols. Keep us from sin. Put us into a place, as I've already prayed this day, that we might truly be a people that display Your righteousness, that display Your glory, that love each other with a supernatural love. And as we depart from this place, plant it deep into our souls that we might be considering each other every moment, that we might pray, that we might serve, and that we would pray that You would give us opportunity to do so. We thank You for loving us, Father. We thank You that we can call You Daddy through Jesus Christ. And in His name we pray. Amen.